you know, I'm a pretty happy-go-lucky person for the most part. I like getting along with people, though I have had in my younger days just as many probably aggravating situations as you have. You know, the kind that make you twist your whiskers, the kind that give you scars, the kind that frustrates you, you know, and you wonder, how in the world could I have gotten into this predicament, Lord? And you just kind of go, man, this isn't the way it's supposed to be. You know, God, I thought that, you know, Christians all love each other, you know, love one another, you know, that kind of stuff. And maybe you did start off in the Jesus movement and we all did love each other, but we were a little naive in some ways because, you see, I, I've been around a long time. You know, I've been a Christian for 30 plus years. <laughs> and I'll be honest with you, you know, I've been burned by Christians big time. You know, lots of times. Lots of different Christians have taken advantage of or falsely accused me of different things. And, Maybe when I was younger, they were right. <laughs> Actually, no, but, you know, oh well. You know, there are extenuating circumstances sometimes. I know that, you know, I've never really tried to burn anybody. I tried to always make good, but, you know, if you're dying of something, sometimes you can't really always work out those kind of financial things, you know. But I know once in a while, you know, I've had people help me. And, you know, I look back on my life and I think, you know, I really owe everybody, you know, something, somewhere, at some point in time, because somebody, somewhere, at some point in time, helped me. So I just figure, well, I'll pass it on, you know, and try to help someone else. Because, frankly, I know that there's this, you know, like, 12-step thing where you try to go back and make amends. Sometimes you really can't do that, you know. Now, I know that most of the time, you know, that Proverbs teaches, he that covereth the matter is, you know, wise friend. Well, love covers a multitude of sins. And I found that, you know, if I really love the brethren like I should, you know, like God wants me to, then I kind of forgive them for burning me, you know. Like, I've been hurt a lot, you know, by ministries or ministers, by pastors, by you name it. And I don't mean just innocently. I mean, they maliciously got me, you know. I've been shocked, you know, at times where I've gone, man, and I know they're a Christian, you know, I mean, I, I looked at them like, you know, I feel like, you know, I got stabbed in the back, and I look at my back, and I look behind me, and I go, and they're a Christian, and they did it. But I always thought of it like, well, Lord, you saw, you know my heart, so I've always let it go, and I know recently we just got burned by a pastor that was, you know, kind of, kind of a landlord, and I went, you're kidding me, you know, I mean, He's not really in ministry, you know, he's, he's in ministry, but he's kind of like, you know, takes down his sign, puts up his sign, takes it down, you know, try to save a little few bucks here, there, a few bucks there, you know, and kind of sad, you know, because I, I care for him, you know, I, I blessed him when I left, you know, and I, I kind of went, wow, boy, you know, he's got a lot of growing to do, you know, and he's kind of into one of those faith ministries, you know, faith of this, faith of that, but he's in just faith, you know, and sad thing is, most of those people that I find, you know, faith-based ministries, you know, they always seem to have it where if you're one of them, you're okay, but if you're not one of them, man, talk about kind of like fleshy, it's, I don't know, maybe they're right, maybe their part in the body of Christ is just to be all faith, 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 you know, gotta have enough faith, you know, faith of this and faith of that, and somehow they're gonna make it. But you know, even that's not that important, because Jesus said in the world you'd have tribulations, you know, he said, the world's going to hate you, you know, and sometimes even your own family's going to misunderstand you, you know, I know my sister, you know, lots of times she, she blesses, you know, what I do, as long as she don't know too much, <laughs> when she gets real close, you know, it's kind of like, you know, she just doesn't, doesn't understand me at all, you know, she's just kind of, no, Michael, I just don't, I don't go there, you know, and it's kind of like, well, you know, that's fine, because you, in your world, you know, I couldn't live. You know, you're the one that's called by God to do what you do, and I'm the one that's called by God to do what I do, and God bless you, and God bless me, and gazootite. Because, <laughs> you know, we all sneeze, 
some point in time. We all got to use some tissue paper, you know, kind of take care of our little, you know, mucus membranes. <laughs> I didn't want to say snot, because <laughs> it's not. <laughs> but the reality is, is that trials and tribulations will come and we'll get scarred by them. We'll get hurt, you know, and we'll be crucified by even our own brethren and our own family and our own friends. And in the world, you know, we're going to have tribulations, just like God said. You know, He promised that we would, but He also promised that He'd be with us. He said that He would take care of us. He said that He would be our comforter and that He would send a comforter to console us. But there's something even more than that, you know, that you can do when you get burned by Christians or by the world or you get hurt or you get kind of like, you know, beat up and stomped on and literally crucified. You can take it as a as kind of like a a blessing from God that he wants to make you tenderized so that you could be sensitive to the other person. You don't have to get revenge. I mean, vengeance is mine, said the Lord, I will repay. So God always takes care of that. You're not supposed to defend yourself. You're supposed to leave it alone. If they want to you know, sue you, give them two coats, you know. If they want to make you go a mile, go two miles, you know. Whatever they want, give it to them. You know, it'll work out for them to be like a, a cancer, you know. It'll kind of eat them up, you know. They just can't stand it when you're willing. You know, they'll, they'll call you a doormat, you know, and I know there are a lot of Christians that like to assert their rights, you know, and say, oh, well, you got to stand up for yourself. No, you don't. No, you don't. Jesus said the opposite. If someone sues you at court, give them your coat too. If someone strikes you on the right cheek, give them the left. You don't fight back. No, you don't need to. God's going to take care of that. Now, if you do fight back and you win your case, you know, well, God bless you. But guess what? God's not going to do anything to that person because you've already done judgment on them. You've already rendered equality as far as God's concerned because you defended yourself and now he doesn't need to defend you. Personally, maybe I'm a little more malicious than you are. I kind of like the way God does things. He tends to get more than what I would have asked for. Ooh, it's kind of eternal. But... Even that, you know, you, you kind of don't want to get involved in that, really. You want to let it go. Because if you keep remembering all the things that have happened in your life, you know, and all the different ways that you've picked up your scar here or your scar there or your scar wherever, you know, you're going to get bitter, you know, and you're not going to get better. You're going to kind of like see that person the next time and avoid them or not be able to talk to them directly. You know, and when it all is said and done and we get to heaven and we've ended this life, you know, the same way we begun in sin and ended in sin, that God will finally change this sinful nature we have into incorruption, well then you could talk to the person. You know, once they're perfect, then who cares? You got there, right? So really that's the point that I'm trying to make is that, you know, we're we're all gonna blow it. We're all going to make mistakes. We're all going to make errors. And sometimes you're going to be the recipient of it, even from Christians, even from pastors, even from people that are men of God that are going to sometimes blow it themselves. Because no man of God is perfect. No man of God is you know, above sin or beyond the reach of Satan or the world or their own flesh or their own issues and circumstances to be tripped up and to make a mistake, to be wrong. Every one of us. We all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And as much as we humble ourselves and try to not do those things that would stumble our brethren, it'll happen. And I know sometimes, you know, maybe people in ministry are a little more hardcore about it because they go on, you know, and it doesn't seem like they care, but you know, you gotta leave that part to God too, you know? You gotta remember that man looks on the outward things, but God looks on the heart. And you know they're gonna go through something, you know. And when they need you, you just be there. You know, don't worry about what you've been through. Just be there for them. You know, because the greatest witness that you have is when you have the right, the justice, the side of righteousness to be supposedly standing up for your cause, and you choose not to. 
and then instead of that you extend mercy and grace to someone believe me it's a powerful witness to the world it stops Satan in his tracks it ends a lot of the principalities and powers and wickedness in high places that happens in the spiritual kingdom that it can't extend itself any farther because you've done the right thing and you've actually put up like a wall that God will not allow anyone to transgress or to cross over because you've made a gulf between what you are in righteousness and what the world is in sinfulness and that's kind of what we need to be doing is living our lives the right way the righteousness way not standing up for ourselves but allowing God to be our righteousness because you can't exercise your own righteousness when you have the righteousness of Jesus in you it's his and not yours it's never about you it's always about what he's done and that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution I am come to set a man at variance against his father and the daughter against her mother and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law and a man's foes shall be those of his own household whosoever will be a friend of the world is an enemy of God you know I I admire a lot of the people that do the whosoever you know kind of ministries but you know and I'm God bless them because they've done a great wonderful thing you know but I hope that in the whosoever they also get to the point of people getting out of the world because sometimes in the whosoever's you know you see a lot of people that are in the world staying in the world using the world the way the world is to be sharing Jesus and you really don't want to do that you know you want to be out of the world you don't want to be worldly in Christianity you want to be godly in Christianity and that doesn't mean to quit being like you know you don't suddenly say hey you know what I, I, I got tats you know and now I'm gonna you know use my tats for God you know and add some more tats you know no it's not that you know Walk with God, you know. Talk with God. Don't, don't exonerate or you know, exemplify you know sin or or whatever it may have been. Yeah, you know, I was a drug addict, you know, and then you know, all you do is you got you know one hour of how you were something in your testimony instead of how you're becoming something in Jesus. You know, sometimes people get that carried away in like Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, they're too busy reliving their bad experience that you think they glorify it, you know, because they're not living the new experience. I personally think, hey, you know what? Take the 12 steps and then get out of it because <laughs> you're beyond it. You've already gone on to the 13th, 14th, and 15th. Hey, you know what? We're walking. We're, we needed a few little helps, you know, kind of walking along, but guess what? Once you got the 12 down, go on. Literally. You know, now maybe you got to keep telling yourself you're this that or the other thing and okay if that's what your faith is you know you know according to your religion you know being so but for me you know it's like we're not a whosoever and we're not a AA and we're not a drug addict or you know clean and sober for so many years or you know uh, sinner saved by grace for so many years or sinner you know whatever but we're sons and daughters of God you know it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him. So right now, according to God, we are children of God. We're sons and daughters of God. So I'd rather think of ourselves as that than to look at ourselves as, you know, like Calvary Chapel or, or Lutheran or Catholic or Methodist or Calvinist or anything, you know, whatever ist it is that you think you ought to be, you know, I'd rather kind of think of ourselves as, you know, we're becoming, you know, like Jesus, but we are right now sons and daughters of God. Because it's not about Jewish roots, you know, which a lot of people get into the Jewish roots, you know, and I keep saying, well, what are you doing sticking your nose in the ground? I mean, isn't that like sticking your head in the sand? I mean, Jewish roots to me is like, you know, you got your nose in the ground and you're going to snort dirt. <laughs> Isn't it time that you kind of like, you know, came up and smelled the roses instead, you know, enjoy the fruit, you know, kind of like, guess what? <laughs> It's not all about the roots. It's a lot about the fruit. Hey, come on now, you know, let's get out of the dirt and start playing up on the branches. You know, it's kind of like I'm the vine, you are the branches. You're not the roots. I'm sorry, <laughs> we went past that stage, so it's time to grow out of it, you know, and grow up and grow into what God wants you to be. So it's not about Jewish roots or you know Christian roots or denying our Christian heritage, whether we were 
you know, admitting that you know all of Protestantism came from Catholicism, you know, and we don't want to admit that part. <gasps> Ooh, no, not one of those, you know. But guess what? You did. Or like, you know, evangelicals don't want to admit, hey, you know what? We're part of like, you know, we were denominational. It's part of our heritage. <gasps> oh no. But you know, it's okay to say that we, by the way, we're a Christian nation, but that's our heritage, you know. You know, it just doesn't make any sense. You know, you got to kind of admit the good with the bad, you know, and be who you are. You know, God brought it all together, you know, and we're one body, one faith, one resurrection, one Jesus, one love, one, <laughs> one God. You know, and he's making us into sons and daughters of God. So kind of accept that more as you walk with God because the world's going to keep coming at you. And until you learn to get along with your brethren, you know, and accept them for who they are as sons and daughters of God. And you're just going to be wind up beating up, you know, yourself. Because really, when you're beating the body, you're beating yourself. So kind of learn that from watching some of these guys that, you know, like point out who's not a Christian or who is a Christian. They're just beating the body. You know, they're like, they're like, you know, they're masochists. They like to beat themselves with a stick, you know, because that's what they're doing, you know. They're a member of the body of Christ, so they're just hitting themselves in the head with a stick constantly saying what's wrong, what's wrong, what's wrong. And they're hitting themselves. They don't realize, hey, you know what? You're beating yourself. You want to get over beating yourself? It looks kind of dumb. Especially from God's perspective. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. All that is in the world. Now remember, that's not just the lust of the eye, lust of the flesh, pride of life. It's all that is in the world because the world got corrupted. It's really not redeemable. God's going to kind of like do a big makeover, you know, and it's going to happen. It's going to be like creation wants to kind of like get recreated, you know, because it's kind of like going to get blasted by the wrath of God, you know. It's going to pretty much wipe out everything you can see standing. So whatever you see in the world right now, ain't going to be there in the kingdom. <laughs> Sorry, it just isn't. The book of Revelation is pretty obvious about the devastation. And man, you know, you can tell me that, you know, your buildings are earthquake proof for, you know, like, oh, I don't know, say 7.0 or an 8.0. But imagine when all the mountains are removed. Did you ever read that in Revelation? You know, the mountains are removed, you know? Hmm. I think if he's going to remove mountains, he could wipe out everything else that man made. Because <laughs> I think we're going to get back to what God made, not man made, so that we can do what God said rather than what man said. Maybe you read it a different way. Maybe it's time to go back and look. Maybe you think there's going to be this, you know, high technology. <laughs> okay. I don't think so. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. You were of the world, and the world would love his own. But because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. The servant is not greater than his Lord. I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. You know, I have a message that you know God's given me that you know I, I've resisted teaching and sharing, you know, and I hint at it all the time, you know, I bring it up about, you know, the violent man and how violence is not the answer and how, you know, we're failing because we're glorifying our soldiers, you know, and we're playing down our missionaries, you know, we're not treating our missionaries as, you know, heroes, but we're treating, you know, men that kill and are killed, you know, that live by the sword and die by the sword as heroes. And, you know, there's a balance to, you know, what I'm saying because it's true that on some respect, you know, you should have, you know, healthy respect for men and women of God that choose to go into a vocation that may be involved in security. I was in security. I was in the military. But at the same time, when you take blood, God requires of you literally the blood. And you will answer for it. Bottom line. You know, it's a not a PTSD, but it is a STSD, a spiritual post-traumatic accountability syndrome. And I wouldn't want to answer. You know, I'm glad that I haven't shed blood. You know, I'm glad that I'm not a violent man. 
I'm glad that the way of peace, I know, because it says that in the latter days, the way of peace they would not know. It talks about how in the latter days that they would beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. So you see, being violent and learning war is it a crude thing. You have to learn it. It isn't something that you just automatically become, like some people think. We're not a fight or flight type of people. We're actually sons and daughters of God. And the world has really gone far away from that teaching that Jesus gave from the Sermon on the Mount and how the Christian church lived for 300 years before it finally got involved in being a part of a war. When, you know, Augustine, not Augustine, when um, the church and the state kind of combined, you know, and they said that he saw a cross in the sky and he decided to conquer in the name of God and he involved Christianity in being the power behind his conquering of the Roman Empire at the time and declaring it a Christian nation. Every time that somebody tells me that America is a Christian nation, I shudder because I know what happened 300 or 2,000 years ago when we had an emperor declare that his empire was a Christian nation. Unfortunately, it wasn't. There were lots of people that lived in it that were not Christian. And the same thing is true about America when it began. It was not a Christian nation. It was a nation under God. One nation under God, indivisible, which it became divided. So, you know, a lot of the things that are said about America are ideas that you can kind of like, you know, already see that it's not quite accurate the way people portray it. It was an idealism that likewise, when Constantine wanted to do the same thing, he said, I want to make it a Christian nation, not that it is a Christian nation. I want to make it a Christian empire. I want to go about and make these pagan relics into Christian relics so that we could bring the unity together of the empire that's fracturing apart because we need to have Roman law. We need to have not chaos, but we need to have free enterprise. We need to have democracy. We need to have these things. And he tried to enforce it through religious law because they tried to enforce it through violent law. And it didn't work. You know, it became corrupted very quickly. And sadly, that's what happens when you put the world inside of Christianity. Because you see, Christianity isn't of this world. You are not of this world. This is not where you belong. This is not your home. You were destined for eternity. This was a temporary place that you were going to exist to live, to come to realization of Jesus Christ in your life. That you would find that God had a plan and a purpose for you. That he designed the world for you to exist in and to come into fellowship and to contact with him. Then determine for yourself which way you would go, whether to fellowship with him and enjoy the benefits of being one with God and living with him throughout eternity, or whether you would choose to be like corruption and be corrupted by the world and then be cast aside into the place where all corruption will go, the lake of fire, where it will be consumed continually forever and ever, constantly in, in separate existence, which is terrifying to behold, which is why it was created that way, because it was meant to be terrifying, so no one would ever do that throughout eternity. And when you think of it that way, then you realize, you know, Maybe I don't want to get involved in some of the worldly things. Maybe I don't want to be part of the world system. Maybe I don't want to keep participating in the worldly Christianity that I see, but I want to become more like the Son of God who said that in the world you shall have tribulation. I have overcome the world. If they have hated me, they're going to hate you. Don't be surprised. Because if you love the world, and if you love the things that are in the world, and you're using the world to bring about Christian causes and Christianity, then you're going to find it's not quite right. Because while you may reach millions of people, if it's not one-on-one -on -one with Jesus, it's not going to be accomplished in the name of the Son. Jesus went and had thousands follow him, but those that stayed were those that he met face-to-face -face and had interpersonal communication with. That's why we talk about a personal relationship with God because it's really not about video, it's not about me, it's not about sharing the Word of God devotionally every day, it's not about even reading the Bible. 
talked about Jesus intervening in a person's life one on one. It's always about one. It's never been about thousands. It's never been about millions. It's never been about the entire world. It's always about God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in should not perish but have everlasting life. And only one person at a time will make that choice. It's not about millions will come forward and all every single one of those people are the same and they all have made a genuine dedication of their life to God. No, they haven't. Because crowds will come. But it's always a one-on-one, -on -one, and only God knows who's saved. And Jesus warned of that, to be sober. Don't be like the world, wanting mega churches and thousands of people and being exonerated and step up in top of a pulpit and be a god and be the gods of men. But rather, be the reality of what the sons of God are and the children of God are, that we would go to them that are in prison and destitute. We would go to them that are poor and needy. We would go to them as we are in the highways and the byways in our life situations and we would share with them Jesus one-on-one. -on -one. Because if it's not about one-on-one, -on -one, it's not done in the name of the Son. It really isn't. It's done in the name of the world and its ways. And we've caught ourselves up into that kind of mentality of evangelism where we think we have to bring more people rather than the few. Many are called, but few are chosen. The gospel has been said to be like a net, that you throw it out, cast, and bring everything in that you can. Well, you know, God bless you. You know, every one of you major evangelists, Billy Graham and Greg Laurie and, you know, all the other people that have been about and sharing that kind of ministry. But you know, there are times and places where I wonder if that is what God wanted, or if that isn't what we've settled for, maybe it's time we, as the body of Christ, stood up and all of us became great glory so we wouldn't need one man to do the work of thousands that we should be doing one-on-one. -on -one. Make it about Jesus one-on-one. -on -one. And you'll find that the world will hate you for it, but you know what? God will love you. That's probably enough. Because as far as I'm concerned, it's not about the one done in the name of the Son. And I'm not going to do it. Because if I have to turn my back on one person in order to minister to thousands, I don't want to be a Christian. I want to hold the hand of the one that's trembling and see the thousands that are rejoicing. I want to hold the hand of the one that's broken and beat up and scarred and just fumbling along and just barely stumbling that I could share the love of God with and tell them it's okay. You'll make it. You're going to get there. And take them by the arm and walk with them because he ain't heavy. He's my brother. I would rather be with that person who has beat me down and then suddenly finds himself flat on their face on the ground and I come along still bloodied by their fists and their words and their scars that they've given to me inflicted and I could look down upon them and have mercy and help them up and we could walk to Jesus together isn't that really what we're about isn't that what the gospel is isn't that what you want to be it is what we do here in video